You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you're here in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is not and, as um, simple you know, I, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many you know, more doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Why take one vacation with the family when you could take all of them? With Royal Caribbean, you don't just go to the beach. You visit a private island and race down the tallest water slide in North America. You don't just go for a road trip. You ATV and zip line through the jungle. You don't just go somewhere new. You rappel down waterfalls and discover ancient temples. Because this isn't just any vacation. This is all the vacations. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. Inches to go. The Vader. 17 to 14. Cowboys out in front. Star begins to count. All right, what's up, gang? Welcome to Packers Total Access. My name is Clayton. You can check us out on Packernet.com. You can find me on Twitter at Packers underscore access. If you'd like to email the show, you can send a message to Packers Total Access at gmail.com. If you'd like to text the show, you can send a text message to 865-658-5824. So on today's show, we actually have a listener uh, text message that came in from our uh, anonymous listener again, <laughs> which their name is now anonymous. I don't know if it's a he or a she. Um, wish they would just make up a name so I could attach it to it. But until then, we're going to call them anonymous. Um, they were just talking about several things that we covered on past episodes that are really key to the uh, the team being successful. Um, you know, whether it's co- it comes to turnover differential, red zone, uh, you know, uh, percentage as far as, you know, scoring touchdowns in the red zone, things like that. So what we did was ran down a few stats. We're going to talk about those things. You know, we're in the dead time right now, right? We're the OTAs just wrapped up. The I'm sorry, the uh, mandatory mini camp just wrapped up. Team isn't going to be back till late July. I think they said they're going to be back in the building on the 25th. There'll be players in the building before then, I'm sure, but they're going to report on the 25th. I think the first practice is the 26th, if I understood the schedule correct. So, you know, we're we're kind of in a dead time until late July. This is when a lot of podcasters take time off. This is when a lot of guys step away and do their vacation time, people that cover the team. What we're going to do is continue on, right? We did this last offseason. We'll probably hit on some history. We'll hit on some, you know, just uh, kind of kind of getting ready uh, for camp, you know, kind of a, a training camp primer, if you will. That's the approach we're going to take. And, you know, when as we get messages from listeners, we're going to keep digging into some of these stats that really matter. And it's, it's funny because this question came in from a listener. I added this information to my big board behind me. That way, as the season gets ready to crank up, as far as, you know, training camp getting going, we're going to be looking at how the roster is going to fall into place, whether it's people who have, you know, current injury concerns like your Rashawn Gary's, your Eric Stokes, players like that, um, how the numbers are going to shake out uh, as far as the cornerback room, Keyshawn Nixon kind of taking that role in the slot. You know, you're hearing Jaden Reed doing a little bit of return responsibilities alongside Keyshawn Nixon. My guess is that's to control the workload when it comes to Keyshawn Nixon playing the slot, which I'm, I can't tell you how excited I am about Keyshawn getting his opportunity in the slot. Um, the only bad thing about that, in my opinion, is, you know, Savage now moves back to safety. We'll see how that goes. Um, but uh, I really think that the slot position is going to get better. Keyshawn's just a baller. There's something about him. I, I told you guys in the past, and I've actually asked listeners this. I've asked co-hosts this, whether it was Jacob or Ryan or whoever. You know, I, I would say, you know, who does Keyshawn remind you of? I know who he reminds me of. And everybody seems to come up with the same answer. And there's two people that I have. It's Charles Woodson. And Micah Hyde. Now, I'm not saying Keyshawn is on the same level of Charles Woodson, especially that player of the year, defensive player of the year uh, season, right? Not saying that at all. I'm just simply saying the way that Wood had a natural ability to be around the ball, and he always played one step ahead. It's like he knew where to take that first step. Keyshawn has that. I think that's what makes him a dynamic returner. And then also when we seen him in the slot, he actually played pretty good. So, um, uh, you know, just little things like that are going to come into play. But listeners pointing out stuff like uh, the one I'm going to read here in a second, 
these are the things we're going to kind of dive into during this dead time so we can all become a little more educated on what actually happened last season while we had the down season. What was the difference between that and the season before and, and the season before that when we had a lot of success, really the three seasons prior to that. So, and then we're going to hear from Larry McCarron, Wes Hockowitz, and Mike Spofford on three things as camp broke and just their three takeaways from training camp or from uh, the OTAs uh, before camp, before everybody breaks. So that's what we're going to do today. I'm going to jump right into the question. And uh, let me say this too. Uh, I'm recording this on Sunday morning. This should go out around noon uh, on Sunday central time. Okay. So you guys will have this pod on Sunday afternoon to be ready for the Monday workday. Now tonight, at 6 Central, 7 Eastern, me and Ryan Schlipp are going to go live for our weekly recap. You guys notice we're, we're kind of doing that in the slot where we normally do the postgame show during the season. Well, in the offseason, we're going to do a weekly recap, and, and hopefully he can join me. That's what's, uh, you know, planned to happen. I know Jacob's a little busy tonight. He may hop on if he gets freed up. But the goal with that is real simple. We want to kind of look back on the previous week and go, okay, what did we learn this week? Right. Because there was plenty of talking points. You guys, I know you're listening to Ryan's pod every day, just like I am. There's a lot of things that's being talked about right now. We can kind of bundle the whole week up in a Packers Total Access episode. That's going to be live on YouTube and Twitter. We uh, encourage you guys to hop on with us and hang out. Uh, give us feedback in the chat. The chat always makes it absolutely awesome. Um, and then another thing that we're adding in this element. OK, we're going to ease into it. We have the ability to add listeners onto the live stream. OK, and the way it's going to work is it's, it's not going to be visual. It's just going to simply be audio. OK, and we're going to test it out. Guys, this may flop flat on its face. And if it does, I apologize in advance. But I'm just itching at getting you guys more involved in the show because your, your feedback matters. And what essentially what I want these Packers Total Access live streams to be is almost like a call in show. Right. And yes, we can get a switchboard and and have a live call in number. But the approach we're going to take is providing a link to specific listeners, people that communicate with me on a regular basis, whether it's through text, email, that are just interested in providing uh, feedback to the show. Those type of listeners. We got a handful of them selected already, and they're going to be in a live uh, Twitter chat. OK, so if you're interested in joining that chat, um, let me know. Shoot me a text. Shoot me an email. Shoot me a Twitter DM. And uh, we'll see if it makes sense for you to join that small group. And then when we're live on these streams, they're going to have the link and they'll be able to hop on in and out. We'll have, you know, a select few of slots. Um, and uh, I don't know if you guys listen to the Paul Feinbaum show. If you are a SEC or a college football fan, now that you've got all these other schools, Texas, Oklahoma, I don't even know who's in the SEC now. It's becoming a nationwide conference, uh, which is so silly to call it the Southeastern Conference. And you got people all the way over in the Southwest that are jo joining. But the way that they structure that call-in show is really good because the callers are so awesome, right? So we want Packers Total Access Live to be that, okay? Understand, it's not convenient for you guys to, you know, just be sitting, listening to the show live. It's very seldom I get to catch a live show. Well, that's what Packernet After Dark is for. At your convenience, you can call in, leave a voicemail, and communicate with Ryan. We want to make sure that is the flagship, okay? I want you to understand this, this live call-in aspect uh, to Packers Total Access Live, in no way, shape, or form is it designed to take anything away from Packernet After Dark. We love what you guys are doing there. I, it's my favorite podcast. I've told you guys this. It has surpassed. I told Ryan this. For me personally, it's surpassed his Packernet podcast. Now, for me on my playlist, it goes right above the Packernet podcast <laughs> because listening to you guys, you know, kind of, hang out with Ryan, and, and and it gets a little goofy. I get it, but that's what it was designed to be is, hey, look, let's just talk about – we could talk about Packers. We can talk about just everything in general. Understand the Packers Total Access Live, we want it to be strictly football, okay? And the guys that I add to that chat, the girls that I add to that chat, they know that, okay, that we're going to keep it strictly football. So, anyway, enough about that. Just want to lay that out there for you. Let's get to the listener question, which I think this provokes some really cool thoughts. So, first thing they said was, again, this is anonymous. Don't know who it is. Um, but it's a, a five, six, three area code. They said, do the Packers total access shows appear on their, on their own podcast or just as a part of Packer net podcast? They are. And I, I responded to this, but I've had this question several times. Where can I find Packers total access where I'm having a hard time finding it? It's under Packer net podcast guys. Listen, we're, we're a part of the Packer net podcast network. Okay. And it's going to be like that. 
for the foreseeable future. I really enjoy working with Ryan. Um, he's the one who gave me an, my first opportunity. Anybody who knows me, I'm a very loyal person. That's where you're going to find that podcast. I've had people say, oh, you should put it under Packers Total Access. It'd be easier to find. I don't care. I want I want you guys to find it. You gals to find it. I do. But it's most important that it stays under Packernet Podcast. Okay, so we're going to make sure that people know that moving forward. Just search Packernet Podcast as you scroll down every podcast that's released. You'll find ours. Uh, you'll be able to see our images, right? So that's how you find it, and that's how it'll always be. But here's the message from the anonymous listener. Also, here's a comment slash question. You recently shared some stats which showed that when the Packers won the turnover battle, they were more likely to win the game. It sounded like it led to the conclusion that the Packers need to focus on winning the turnover battle as a strategy in its own right. But in in my opinion, a turnover isn't worth much unless it results in points on the board. The Packers need to maximize the opportunities given by those turnovers by improving their performance in the red zone. I would like to know more about the games they lost despite winning the turnover battle. What was the difference in overall number of possessions? What was the result of the subsequent possession uh, caused by the turnover? Were the Packers able to capitalize on it? It would be an interesting topic to look into. Also, how do you access the All-22? Is it available to the public? Thanks. Okay, so I'm not going to dig into all those because there's some of those stats that they asked for that are very, very specific. I don't have the time nor the resources to try to comb through all the stats. I gave it one good college try today, and the numbers that I came away with is what I'm going to share. And I think it's going to be important information, but the, the stuff that's specific of did they score – off a of possession with the turnover, this and that. Now I think you're splitting hairs, um, me personally. And thank you so much for the message. Awesome, uh, thought-provoking idea, and that's why we're going to dive into it here. But, you know, when you're talking about, well, you know, it's it's more important with the – absolutely it is. You know, you don't get – the win-loss total has nothing to do um, in the standings. They don't look up and go, okay, who won the turnover battle? All right, give them a win. It doesn't work like that. The score is always going to matter more than anything. I know some of you guys are giggling, go, of course it does. That's that's a stupid comment. But what leads to you having the, the leading score, right? And that's when you dive in. And there's a number of ways you can take this statistically, right? But at the end of the day, what are the most important stats? Okay, let's talk about the turnover battle first and foremost, Okay. The turnover bat battle all time. We talked about these numbers the other night. I can't remember who it was on the live stream. A listener actually uh, laid these numbers out. I chased down the, the updated numbers. To the best of my knowledge, this is updated through 2022, all time in the history of the NFL. Okay. The turnover battle all time. If you win the turnover differential battle plus one, okay, meaning you, you took the ball away one time more than the other team. Okay. It could be. The only turnover of the game, you won it one to zero. It could be, you know, you won the turnover battle two to one or three to two or four to three. If you win that turnover turnover battle plus one, you have a 69.6% .6 chance of winning the game. That means that of all time games in the NFL, if a team had one more takeaway, right, or one less turnover than the other team, they won 69.6% .6 of the time. OK, that's a hard fact. That's a hard statistic that you can lean on. Why do I know that? Because Hall of Fame coaches lean on that stat. You know, um, trying to think of who it was, Bill Parcells. He pointed this stat out. There's multiple NFL films sessions where you can see where they were following him around, whether it was in Dallas in the latter years or in the New York Giants uh, in his early years, you know, as a head coach when he won, I think, a couple Super Bowls there. Of course, he turned that Dallas franchise around real quick before Jerry Jones started uh, sticking his nose into the business. But um, he always pointed these stats out. That was something that was very important to him, right? You remember when Matt LaFleur took the job? I remember that very first training camp. You guys have heard me talk about this multiple times in that very first training camp. I remember it was one of the first practices they had where they had live hitting Devonte Adams of all people fumbled. He fumbled a ball and they said, Matt LaFleur, little, little nice Matt, right. That's just happy. Go lucky. Never says anything negative. He blew the whistle and screamed at the top of his lungs. They said, if you do not protect the football, you will not play for me. Right. So we know how important it is to Matt LaFleur. This is all time guys. You're talking about all time. This is a hard fact, 69.6% .6 of the time. If you win the turnover battle plus two, so if you had two more takeaways than the other team, your winning percentage goes up to 83.9%. If you do plus three, 
it goes up to 90.7%. So to go back to what the caller was pointing out is, hey, look, it isn't everything. I'm not saying it's everything, but it is one of, if not the most important team statistics when it comes to wins and losses in the history of the National Football League. So when you look at it in that perspective, what should your emphasis be, right? It should be on protecting the football, first and foremost. Now, people will say, well, you got to be more aggressive. You know, there's an old NFL Films uh, clip, and uh, I think it's lost. I couldn't find it. Michael Lombardi talks about it in his book and several other places about how uh, when when Bill Belichick went away from Bernie Kosar, which you guys know Bernie Kosar came out in the supplemental draft. He was a Cleveland guy. He wanted to play for the Browns. Everybody in Cleveland loved him. He was a fan favorite. He could do no wrong. He was a pretty decent quarterback in his prime. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, he Bill Belichick pulled him out of the game. And they said that Bernie scoffed at Belichick and was like, I'm I'm freaking whatever it was, nine for 12 right now. How are you pulling me out of the game? And Belichick pointed out, yeah, for whatever it was, 60-some yards. You know, you can be efficient. You can be accurate. But if you're not moving the chains and you don't have explosive plays, <clears throat> explosive plays is something that Bill Belichick takes very, very serious. And I know uh, pretty much every – Every head coach across the league has an explosive uh, play. Um, you know, uh, what, am, what am I looking here? What are the word? Uh, someone who's going to do analytics for explosive plays and make sure, hey, look, we've got explosive plays. There's an NFL film session where I think it was a, a football life where they followed Belichick around in a two-part series, and he gave he gave his players absolute hell over. We haven't had one big play. What, what, they didn't have a single play of – more than 20 yards or whatever it was, more than 40 yards, whatever the explosive play, however you want to break that statistic down because people look at it in different measurables. Um, and then in that one game, they blew up. And you can see Robert Kraft, the owner of the Patriots, his son, um, uh, I can't remember his son's name, Jonathan Kraft, I believe it is, said, man, Bill was giving them heck over not having explosive plays, any explosive plays this year. And, and I think in that one game alone, they had like three or four. It just blew up, right? So those things are important as well. But turnover differential is really, really, really important. Like, to me, that's what you base your offense around is, look, we want to be as aggressive, aggressive as possible. As we know in the West Coast offense, there's always a shot. Nine times out of ten, there is a shot in every pass route combination right, in every concept. You're going to have one shot route and several underneath, and depending on the pre-snap look, that determines whether you're going to can out of the play, go to the run, go to a different pass, and and typically you have a shot um, on every play. Now, there's some cases where you're running a, a rap tech, uh, a rap concept, as, uh, as we seen last year. That's one passing concept that, uh, that I didn't expect, but they ran it a lot. The, and, and basically the way the rap concept, what uh, uh, Kurt Warner refers to as a rap concept, is you've got, let's say you've got two receivers on the left side of the line of scrimmage. The inside receiver is going to run a short curl, and then you're going to have a deep dig on the over top of it. So you're basically, it's a high-low concept. You're, you're reading high to low or low to high, depending on what the, the pre-snap sugar is. And when I say sugar, I mean, what's the pre-snap alignment? Is there late rotation? Is the defense trying to trick you into thinking, hey, look, we're, I, we want them to believe we're running this, but in the end, here's what we're running. You know, whether it's a single high man look or it's a single high zone look, which is typically a cover three, or if you've got two on the shelf and you're going to play two high man or you're going to play a cover four or a cover six look where you're trying to disguise what you're doing underneath. And according to Kurt Warner, you know, Jordan Love did an excellent job working that route, that rap concept. He's very good at making the decision quick. Um, as soon as the back foot hits, driving the ball, and when his back foot is planted and that toe's in the proper place like we've seen his uh, personal quarterback coach talk about over and over and over, he's accurate de delivering the football. That's a concept that he can really lean on, especially when people are showing a too high look. Now, I'm going to get into stuff later on in a later episode that Greg Cosell talked about. I want time to study what he talked about to make sure I get my facts right. But he, he talked about basically how – how that too high look, that that cover four top defense um, with man principles beyond the 10 and 15 yard mark um, has really taken over the turnover differential game. Okay. And uh, it, it's something, in my opinion, that Aaron Rodgers struggled with. And I think it's because of pre snap sugar, they were forcing him to stay in the RPO game a little too much. Okay. And with Jordan Love, maybe he'll go away from that RPO pass a touch and stick with the run, which in those two high looks, that's what you want to do. You want to run people out of two high looks. What do I mean by that? If you've got two on the shelf, right, and your corners are playing off the ball to where they're not going to be a factor in the running game, at least initially, whether you're running a wide zone or an inside zone, 
you got the safeties deep off the ball, then you want to take advantage of that. And when you run them out of that too high look, guess what happens? They start to do an early rotation. The sugar leaves the playbook, right? That pre-snap trying to trick you look, and they're going to roll that safety into the box like we seen when Eddie Lacy was a running back in Green Bay there for four years before he, you know, obviously uh, um, I don't want to be mean, but didn't take it as serious as we should have been. I'm a huge Eddie Lacy fan. He's one of my favorite players of all time. He was so much fun to watch. But, um, you know, before he left, and I think he ended up in Seattle before he was out of the league, um, that that guy was one that forced them to drop people into the box. Now, you could say, yeah, Amon Green did it as well, and and I'm sure Mike Wall, when we have him back on the show, he would agree to that. But that was a different era, too. Those early 2000s, they were running a lot of power. They were running a lot of heavy sets. I mean, there was times where they only had one receiver on the field. They were running jumbo packages. Of course, they're going to roll the safety in. But in today's NFL, where it's majority 11 personnel, and typically with the Packers, the second uh, amount of personnel, as, as, far as, as far as percentage goes, will be 12, then, um, you know, you're going to, especially when you flex Luke Musgrave out, right? And he's going to be that F, that, that F uh, receiver, F tight end, whatever you want to call him. And you've got a tight end attached, then you've got him out wide. Maybe you've got a tray or a trips look right with him out wide, um, they're still going to treat him like a receiver. I don't know, man. I, I can kind of see this running game really taking off. Um, but to sit here and pretend that teams are going to respect Jordan Love the way they did Aaron Rodgers and show the same amount of two high looks, I think that's probably uh, that's probably not a fair guesstimate. You know, I think we'll see a little more, you know, uh, defenders in the box until Jordan Love shows them, hey, we can beat you over the top like A-Rod could, especially down the boundary. So um, now on to the next part of the listener's question. Said, uh, I'd like to know more about the games they lost the spot when in the turnover battle. So I don't want per- I don't want to put words into the listener's mouth, okay? But the vibe I get, and this is the thing about text messaging, I think the statistic is like 92% of the uh, the uh, the context of, of communication when you're texting, 92% of it is lost because you don't have voice inflection, you don't have eye contact, you don't have body, uh, you know, uh, body language, all those things. So it's easy to take text messages wrong. So if I'm wrong and you're the listener, message me and say, hey, no, I didn't mean it like that. And I'm not mad. I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just I'm kind of going off of the vibe I got from the text. Right. Um in that part of the text message, you know, I'd like to know more about the games they lost the spot winning the turnover battle. It feels like you're going the turnover battle isn't that important. Right. And maybe I'm wrong in, in thinking that was your take. But there were, he, they, they basically asked um, how many of the games, how many of the losses did we actually win the turnover battle? Right. And, and I think what they were thinking is when we dug into it, we would find, oh, wow, wait, we won the turnover battle, but we still lost the majority of the games. That wasn't the case. Of the nine losses, you know, Packers went eight and nine last year. Of the nine losses, only two of those losses came with us winning the turnover battle, the Buffalo Bills game and the Tennessee Titans game, okay? Um, we won the turnover battle with at the Bills 2-1, to one, okay? But we still lost the game, and we lost the game significantly. I think it was by like 10 points, if I remember right. The Titans uh, game, we lost the turnover battle one to nothing, and we still – or I'm sorry, we won the turnover battle one to nothing, but we still lost the game, okay? Now, if you guys remember – the Bills game, there were people saying the Bills were kind of playing with their food there at the end. I don't like takes like that, personally, simply because it it, it sends this message like, oh, well, they know they've won the game. They're just playing around now. That wasn't the case. They were still seeing something in the game plan where they were looking to take shots. Well, there was a little bit of truth in the fact that we won that turnover battle against the Bills uh, because they were still kind of taking shots at the end when they probably should have just been focused on their four-minute offense. So that number, in my opinion, is a little bit skewed. But, again, I'm not going to override the statistics. We're going to treat it as just as if, uh, you know, the same way the listener kind of pointed out and trying to figure out, you know, in these losses, how many times did we win the turnover battle? We won two of those games. We won the turnover battle. So, basically, a 2-7 and seven record of the games that we lost, right, only two of those nine games that we lost, we actually won the turnover battle. So you can see, I mean, that's guys, that's a little, what, a little bit, a little better than 20%, right? So that turnover differential is absolutely freaking huge. When they said this, I kind of perked up and got excited. Like, that's a good, that's a great question. Let me dig into that and see. I might be wrong here as far as how important it is. No, 
if anything, it galvanized that thought process, that opinion of turnover battle really, really matters, right? Because like I said, in those nine losses, only two of those did we win the turnover battle. Now, if you looked at the middle eight, I just about guarantee you the middle eight was the side and the factor. At least it became a push. You guys know I'm not suggesting you go out and gamble, okay? So anytime I talk about me gambling, please don't take it as Clayton you know, encourages his listeners to go gamble. That's not the case at all. There was a time in my life where I was too immature to gamble, and there was a time in my life where I just wasn't interested in it. But now I love live betting. I love watching a game. And whether it's at halftime or getting, you know, in early into the third quarter of a football game, whether it's college football or pro football, I really like to throw some action on those live games. It's a lot of fun, a lot of fun, especially with the point spread. Um, but you guys know that the two key statistics I use is turnover differential, right, and the middle eight. So once the middle eight's complete, what I do is look at the live, the live betting and go, okay, this team here, um, is catching, you know, plus four points based off the current score. But they're currently winning the turnover differential battle two to nothing, and they've won the middle eight, but somehow they're not winning. History suggests they're going to pull that game out, right? Well, even though they may not win the game, if I'm catching four points, if they end up losing that game, you know, history is on our side big time in that scenario. But if I'm catching four points, there's a good chance that even if they lose the game, it's going to be by less than four points. So that's how I play the live gambling game because these two statistics are that important. When you couple in the fact that you got a plus two turnover differential of 83.9%, plus you won the middle eight, your chances of winning that game is probably over 90%. Now, given the current score, probably not going to happen. But when you're catching four points, seven points, nine points in that scenario, it's like, Momentum is huge in the NFL, and momentum will probably propel that team to be able to clear that point spread from a sense of they're already catching four points, five points, seven points, whatever it is. That's how I like to. And it's it's been very, very successful for me. Now, of course, the betting odds will reduce the amount of profit that you can make off of those bets, but you win so often that I've come out really, really, uh, really good in the end. And I'm looking forward to utilizing it again this year. So let's move on to the next aspect. They mentioned red zone performance, right? How often are the Packers capitalizing off of turnovers? That was a very, very hard statistic to find. So I focused on red zone percentage because this is something I've been wanting to look into. The vibe I got last year was we really, really sucked in the red zone. But when you think about those red zone opportunities, the things that come to mind for me were – it wasn't the Buffalo game. It was definitely the Detroit game on the road. That one came to mind. The Tennessee game on the road came to mind. There were several times where we got in the red zone and just didn't capitalize, right? But when you look at the statistics, here's how they lay out, okay? The the listener said in the message, they need to, they need to improve the red zone performance, right? So let's see where the Packers ranked last year. In red zone performance, understand this doesn't include field goals. This is just touchdowns. Touchdowns in the red zone. After the Packers get inside the 20-yard line, um, how often do they score a touchdown? Okay, They scored a touchdown 51.8% of the time once they entered the red zone, which was 23rd in the league. Guys, that's pretty bad. And now you take that into consideration with losing the turnover battle in uh, uh, seven of the nine losses, right? You factor in the middle eight, that becomes a huge statistic. Now, you know how I said the Detroit game really stood out to me. That's because we lost a turnover battle in Detroit like three to one, right? So three to one, you know, that's a plus two. We had an 83.9% chance of losing that game, obviously. Okay. So when you look at home versus away, when the Packers were at home, their red zone touchdown percentage was 61%, almost 10% higher than their yearly average. So you know what that means? Away, it must have been horrible, right? That 61% at home was 10th best in the league. Guys, that's good enough to be a playoff team. But on the road, they were 26 at 42.8%. So why do I point that out? First of all, the listener brought it up. It was thought-provoking for me. And I look at this team going into this year, what needs to change for the Packers to be successful? Guys, we're, we're minus a Hall of Fame quarterback now. Whether you like Aaron or not, he's a Hall of Fame quarterback. And there's some going, he wasn't last year. Right, but he had a broken thumb. we got to point that out. Uh, there's some people 
who are going to go really, really quiet if Aaron goes to New York and lights it up, especially with the team that I feel like personally, the Jets. I said this when the trade rumors started early in the offseason. I don't see him going to the Jets. They're not a they're not a dominant team. Why would he go to the Jets? Right? That's the way I seen it. Other people seen it like this team is built to win now. They're just minus a quarterback. If Aaron goes to the Jets and he just plays lights out, that team is going to propel into the playoffs. There's no doubt in my mind, right? And there's a lot of people that that were going to die on that hill screaming, Aaron's washed up, Aaron's horrible, blah, blah, blah. If he goes over there and performs, he doesn't even have to perform at MVP level. If he performs at a top 10 level with a healthy thumb, if he reduces those turnovers, which is what killed us last year, that and fumbles, you know, obviously interceptions and fumbles, which is how we got to this number of 42.8% on the road then they're going to propel right into the playoffs and, and and be a great team. But if Jordan Love performs at Aaron Rodgers' level last year and this team can kind of rise up a little bit, what are the key statistics we need to focus on for them to be successful in 2023? And for me, it's turnover differential and middle eight, and probably the third most would be that red zone percentage, maximizing those opportunities. Last year, and while Aaron was here, I don't know if it was Matt LaFleur or not. First of all, it was Matt LaFleur in the end because if he's given Aaron the the ability to choose whether we go for it on fourth down or not, then that's on Matt LaFleur. That's not on Aaron Rodgers. You can get mad at Aaron Rodgers all you want, but he's the head freaking coach. He needs to act like the head freaking coach. And people go, well, he couldn't because Rodgers was this big glooming cloud. I don't care. You're the leader of the organization. If, if you're not willing to say, no, we're doing it my way, then you're not the leader of the organization, right? And, and it's it's amazing how conveniently it changes from this was Matt LaFleur's offense to it wasn't. You know, the first year in 2019, they every everyone said, you know, the numbers took a little bit of a dip, right? Aaron didn't win an MVP or what have you. And then, um, you know, we still won 13 games, mainly because we had a great defense, if I remember correctly. That was the famous game where Aaron said, you know, we got us a defense in that very first game of the season, right? Aaron said going into that year, it, you know, the, the days of the, the inflated numbers are over, right? So in year one, you see this hybrid of McCarthy's offense and LaFleur's offense. The team played good. You win 13 games, but the offense didn't really pop. The next year, the offense popped, right? I think what you started to see was a little more of it lean into Matt LaFleur's system, but they started to go to the RPO game, which the entire NFL did. Bang, Aaron wins an MVP. We have one of the top offenses in the league. In 2022, what happened? The RPO game ramped up even more. Another MVP, or in 2021, another MVP, another top, you know, top five offense in the league, if I remember correctly, right? And then last year, what happens? Aaron breaks his thumb. We lose Devontae Adams. The RPO game isn't near as strong. We still tried to lean on the RPO game. But understand, this is Matt LaFleur's offense. The RPO game is a huge part of the L.A. Rams and Sean McVay. It is. And, and, and people are trying to go, no, we're, we're just refusing to run Shanahan's offense. It's never been Shanahan's offense. You don't believe me, go look at the Titans when Matt LaFleur was there. If you don't believe me, go look at the Falcons when Matt LaFleur was the quarterback coach for Matt Ryan. And at that time, the offensive coordinator was actually Kyle Shanahan. So when Kyle Shanahan goes to the 49ers, things kind of switch. You, you match up to the personnel you have. And in Green Bay, we were built for 11 personnel under Mike McCarthy, so there had to be this shift into Matt LaFleur's system. Now, we were trying to hang on with, you know, for dear life last year with Mercedes Lewis, Alan Lazard, Randall Cobb, all these guys that that we chose, you know, to bring in that that Aaron wanted Randall Cobb. That's the guy he got. That's what cracks me up, too. These are the guys he wanted. You can say these are the guys he wanted, but he asked for one that wasn't on the roster, and it was Randall Cobb, and he got him. Well, he asked for multiple, but that's the one guy that they brought in. So now if this team is built for more 12 personnel, we can start to shift into more of a running game, and maybe we'll see some more of that that uh, Kyle Shanahan look. I, I hope that's the case anyway. Um, if, if it doesn't happen this year, then we need to shut up about, you know, <laughs> Aaron Rodgers was the reason that we didn't uh, didn't go to it. If we don't come out and see a whole lot of pre-snap motion, eye formation looks like uh, San Francisco ran last year, then we need to stop the whole, you know, Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. 
Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is not uh, as simple as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened up so many more doors. The show is called The The Deal. Deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Why take one vacation with the family when you could take all of them? With Royal Caribbean, you don't just go to the beach. You visit a private island and race down the tallest water slide in North America. You don't just go for a road trip. You ATV and zip line through the jungle. You don't just go somewhere new. You rappel down waterfalls and discover ancient temples. Because this isn't just any vacation. This is all the vacations. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo Concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price. Priceline. That you know, Aaron Rodgers is keeping us from run, running Kyle Shanahan. Matt Lafleur has every opportunity to run Kyle Shanahan's offense this year, and we're going to see if it's going to happen. So, um, another comment. I just want to point that out, though. Uh, red zone performance, twenty third in the league at fifty one point eight percent. Home, they were tenth, which was great. On the road, they absolutely sucked, twenty sixth at forty two point eight percent. Now, the next part, he said, "quote in the in the text quote isn't worth much unless you score." Right. Well, of course, I mean, that goes without saying every offensive game plan is designed to score. Yeah. There's not one single game plan, not one single drive in any offense across the National Football League where a coach is going, you know, what? right here. I don't care if we score. Let's just kind of let's just kind of see what we can do. No, dude. Every freaking play call is designed to set up the next play call. And you've got a chart of first and long. You've got first, or I'm sorry, you got first and long, you got second and long, you got second and medium, second and short, you got third and long, third and medium, third and short. And everything's on that chart is designed to succeed. There's no play call sequence that goes, ah, we'll just kind of score here. Right. So to say it, you know, it isn't worth much unless you score, you're absolutely correct. But that goes to the game of football. The number one statistic that trumps every statistic that we're talking about is is freaking wins and losses, right? The second most is how many points you score and how many points you give up. All of this stuff that we're talking about, that that goes without saying, but everything else we're talking about is what is is just crammed into giving you that result of points scored, points allowed, and then, of course, um, wins versus losses. Um, I don't mean to sound condescending there. That's not not my goal, but the way it was kind of worded was like, well, it ain't, it ain't worth much unless you even score. Of course not. But there are things that matter within the game that determines whether you score or the other team scores. Um, every offensive game plan, like I said, is designed to score, okay? There's zero play call sequences that says, let's just don't worry about scoring here. And I'm not saying that that's, that's what you're saying in the text. It's just I want to make that clear here that I don't mention that because it kind of goes without saying, right? Now, you can emphasize protecting the football, right? You know, staying within your keys, not trying to play, uh, you know, not trying to play the uh, the the type of football where it's like, OK, I'm going to go off cuff here like Jair has done several times and say, I'm jumping this route underneath, even though I know my responsibility is deep. Right. Um, things like that. Not playing that hero ball, playing within the scheme, playing within the parameters of, hey, look, the last thing we want to do is turn the football over. The top priority is scoring points, but not we're not going to do that by being so negligent with the football that we're just going to turn it over because once you lose that turnover battle, even just plus one, you've now lost almost 10% chance of winning the ball game. Okay. Very, very important. Let's see here. Uh, so um, how do you, how do you take the ball away more on defense? Right. And this is something that Belichick's done great. You guys know I've, I've studied Belichick like crazy. He does a tip drill. And, uh, and another thing he does is eyes on ball, right? 
Um, Greg Cosell did a great breakdown the other day of his target system, um, how uh, Belichick has a quote-unquote bullseye defensive system where you focus on taking away the number one priority in that offense. Like when he plays us, um, his his number one goal would have been take away Devontae Adams, make him play left-handed. He always does that. And he typically takes he typically takes the number two and the number three corner and doubles the number one target and then puts his number one corner on the number two target. So now you're locking – and he plays a lot of man coverage. You're locking down the strengths of the offense and forcing them to play left-handed and go to the number three and number four target or stick with the run, which – his his defense is typically really good against the run too, you know, historically anyway. But one of the things he focuses on, two things he focuses on, tip drills and eyes on ball. Now, what does eyes on ball mean? They do basically jump ball drills. You guys know what a tip drill is. I'm not going to explain it. But they have a certain part of their practices, and, and I hear them talking about this on on their local podcast that, that covers the team. Um, which is Patriots Unfiltered. If you guys want a, a secondary podcast that it doesn't have anything to do with the Packers where you can just kind of learn inside another organization, they do a really good job with Patriots Unfiltered. But it's basically they throw deep balls and they teach the DBs to get their head around and find the football. Okay, When you're in man coverage primarily, which the Patriots are, it's huge. It's absolutely huge to make sure you're getting your eyes around and finding the ball. You know, last year it was so difficult watching Eric Stokes play corner um, because in Fangio's defense, once once the outside receiver clears a certain point, if you're in that traditional cover four, it turns into man coverage. Okay, so once they clear the, you know, whether it's you know, there's different there's different setups for different downs and distances, but once they clear the 10, 15, 20 yard mark, if Eric Stokes is on the boundary, if that guy's just running a nine route, then he knows once he clears 10, 15, 20 yards, whatever the parameters are set by the uh, by the defensive coordinator in the scheme itself, then this turns into man coverage. So as you're running deep down the sideline, what do you need to do? You're playing with good technique, whether it's mirror match press or press, uh, you know, typically in Fangio style, as we all know, they play off the ball. I know people are losing their mind over that, but it is what it is. Um, it puts you in a position to be able to, to, to play that kind of that catch man look once the cover four does turn into man coverage. When you clear that, you know, it's a nine route, you got to get your freaking head around. I, there's nothing more frustrating, and it's easy for me to see, say, you know, being fat, old, and out of shape, sitting on the couch, going, "How does he not get his head around?" But it's like, you see the receiver still running deep, you see his eyes in the air, you know the ball's on its way, and you never get your hands up, and you never even get your head around to see if you can make a play on the ball. I've seen multiple times within this defense that these DBs that are supposed to be first round picks don't come away with an interception because it's like they don't have the awareness to, oh, I need to get my head around. I promise you, Matt LaFleur, Joe Barry, and whoever the DB coach is now isn't isn't out there in the practice field going, don't worry about getting your head around and finding the ball. Just run stride for stride with the receiver, and if they catch it, they catch it. They're not coaching that way, guys. So this is on these DBs that are supposed to be first-round picks, right? And, and the money that Jair's getting paid now, man – Somebody said the other day, over, under for five interceptions. You know, it is a lot of interceptions, but at the same time, it's a lot of freaking money. There's many DBs in the league that can get that head around and make a catch on the ball, right? Can catch the ball uh, when it's thrown in their area if it's not an absolute dime or they're not getting scorched by, you know, a receiver. So, that to me, that gets frustrating at times. But that's why I was very discouraged about Eric Stokes. I hope Eric Stokes is healthy. I don't want to see his career go down uh, downhill simply because he, he had that that crazy injury and they talk about him being in a wheelchair for a little bit. I don't wish ill will on anybody, but I'm not going to sit here and BS you guys. I try to give it to you both barrels, 100% the way I see it, not saying it's right, but at least you guys will come away going, that's what Clayton thinks. I'm not saying it's right. And no, nor do you have to agree with it, but I always want you to come away going, there's, there's no doubt in my mind. Clayton believes this is the way things are or way things should be. And he's going to tell you when he's wrong, right? That's my goal. But when it comes to, you know, who are the best DBs on the field, I, I'm not upset that Eric Stokes isn't going to be healthy, right, from a football fan standpoint. I'm not going, dang it, if Eric Stokes was just healthy. I think, and Joe Barry said this in the offseason, we're going to put the best five on the field. Me personally, I think your best cornerback combination is Jair on the boundary, Rasul Douglas on the boundary, Keyshawn Nixon in the slot. That could change within one or two weeks, guys. Keyshawn Nixon may get absolutely scorched, but off the little film I've seen of him in the slot from 2022, I think he's got an opportunity to play really well there. I don't think Stokes is a slot receiver, right? 
He's got all the physical ability of the world, and you you drafted him because he had that crazy 40 time, and he has all this – he has the arm length, everything you want RAS-wise uh, for a corner, right? But if you can, if you don't have the awareness to turn around and find the ball when you're in man coverage simply, uh, essentially deep down the field in that cover four or cover six look, if you're the, the deep responsibility on the boundary, then you're doing us no good, right? So I'm excited to see those three corners work in unison together, right? Jair made a joke that that he may try to take Keyshawn's slot occasionally, right? Which kind of led me to believe, are they giving them the freedom like they did last year to line up where they want to? You guys heard us talk about that, and it's still a little bit of mystery around that. I don't want anything to sound definitive from me, but that's kind of the vibe I got, uh, was they have the freedom to line up where they want when they want um, within the scheme, but basically meaning – if Jair gets a wild hair and says, I want to play the slot this snap, he can slide into the snot slot and whoever's playing the slot needs to kick outside. Um, I like the idea of Keyshawn playing playing that slot because he just works so good. He's got he's got such good balance as we see on the kick returns, right? You've seen it over and over and over. That's the thing. He doesn't have blazing speed. He doesn't have crazy acceleration. He's got a good cutting ability, great balance, and great vision. All those things are important to play the slot. So this might be a diamond in the rough. And, of course, you've seen the incentives. I don't have the details put up right now. But there were a lot of uh, slot corner incentives for him as far as interceptions and things like that. He's going to have an opportunity to make some extra cash uh, performing well as a slot corner. And he's even, like Ryan pointed out in his pod the other day, which was really cool, um, uh, You know, he's even kind of trying to uh, convince Matt LaFleur to let him play offense. I like Matt LaFleur's answer. Hey, look, let's let's become an elite cornerback and returner before we focus on trying to play on the offensive side of the ball. But Keyshawn's just a spark plug, man. He's Mr. Positivity. He's Mr. Hey, look, let's get the job done. I think he's going to be a bottle. I I would really like to see him voted team captain, you know. This year with people at left, Mercedes Lewis is gone. A lot of people haven't thought about this. To the best of my knowledge, we picked six captains, I believe. I think there was three offense, three defense. Of those six captains, I think Adrian Amos was a captain, I believe. I know Mercedes Lewis was a captain. I know Aaron Rodgers was a captain. Okay. So the, if I'm correct in that, there's three captain voids there. Some of you guys are getting upset right now hearing my boy going, here's this stupid captain talk again that's caused a lot of division because Jair got upset last year. If your teammates don't vote you a captain, you ain't got the right to get upset about it. That's just my personal opinion. I, I don't know. That's just kind of how I see that. Maybe I'm old school, but that's it's simple to me. Um, but who are those three guys going to step in, right, and fill that void? Who are going to be the three captains? That's exciting to think. All right, who's going to fill those voids? Are they going to vote Jordan Love a captain? You know how cool that would be if Jordan Love steps in and he's a team captain his first year as a starter? Man, they're already galvanized around him, right? They're they're all – you can tell that's, that's QB1. I can't remember who it was at the paintball. I think somebody said it was Jaden Reed. I thought it was Keyshawn Nixon. It may have been Jaden Reed. Somebody had – Socks on that had Jordan Love on their socks, right? You heard Jair Alexander come up behind him and put his arm around him while they were interviewing Jordan Love. I shared that on Twitter. Uh, if you haven't seen that, go check it out. It's really, really cool. Where he comes up and said, this is the best quarterback in the league right here. Yeah. Do, does he believe that? Probably not. But he's letting Jordan Love know, man, I got your freaking back, dude. And everybody in that locker room is kind of uh, rallying around him. It's really, really exciting. So the last part of that message from the user, all 22 – they asked, uh, I think, I don't want to get it wrong here. Yeah. Also, how do you access the All-22? Is it available to the public? Thanks. Unfortunately, it's not. Now, I've had several people try to send it to me in folders through Google Drives and stuff. I'll be honest with you. As I was digging through that stuff, it was a little bit unorganized, but also I felt kind of grimy. I was like, man, I don't know. this feels like we're kind of still in this, right? Some of you guys are going, oh, come on, Clayton, don't be a stickler. That's just me. I, I don't, I don't want to steal an audio book from anyone. You know, audio books are so scarce today because publishers don't want to put them out there because they know they're going to get ripped and not necessarily sold on a black market. But it's going to be, you know, kind of uh, just kind of out there for the public. Guys, they put a lot of work into that material. Right. And and they should get compensated for it. Me personally, I, I, I've i told authors, too, well, if you can just get me an audio book, I'll pay a little bit extra premium just to have that book. I love your book and I want an audio form, but they're so nervous about getting it out there. Um, so when I see these this all 22 being shared, it kind of makes me like, I don't know, man, the way that you can purchase it is through NFL game pass. And I can't remember what the cost is. I get it every year. It's like, I want to say it's like anywhere from a hundred to $200 a season, but NFL game pass is awesome. Basically 
24 hours after the game is played, you have the TV broadcast version of the game in its entirety. You have um, just snap to snap, which you can watch the game in like 40 minutes as a condensed version, which is awesome if you're just wanting to kind of go through and rewatch the game really, really quickly. And then you got all 22 tape, right? But I will say this. If you're not interested in purchasing NFL Game Pass, um, one thing that you can do um, is, uh, you know, I watch each game with a notepad, right? And as I'm watching the game, I go through and jot down notes. That's what I do, right? I I jot down notes on key plays, and I put the time stamp down. So I go, okay, this was first quarter, 1325 left in the first quarter, here was a huge play by Keyshawn Nixon, knocked the ball down, playing the slot, right? Something like that. And I know when I go back and watch the game, which I watch every snap three times, I'm looking for those plays. It's rare I find myself going, oh, I need to find this on the All-22. First of all, when I do Chalk Talk, what I found out real quick, and everything's trial and error with this pod, is when I do Chalk Talk, the All-22 is kind of hard to see, right? The only thing it's really good for is to go, okay, there's where the safeties were. Got it. But it's very rare I find myself – and Chalk Talk trying to explain, here's why the play should have been successful or will be successful. It's more along the lines of why was it successful or why was it not successful. Very rarely do the safeties up top or the, the depth of the cornerbacks have to do with the reason the play wasn't successful or was successful. So I find myself using the TV copy more often. So I suggest DVR, record it, right? You paid for that if you're watching the game. You can legally record that stuff, right? And also, it's free on YouTube in some cases. And if it and understand when when it's free on YouTube, if somebody posted it, it didn't get taken down, it got a copyright hit. But if you notice in the copyright clause, it says this is allowed to be shared on YouTube. So the NFL is okay with that being shared on YouTube because it's kind of free marketing, free advertising. But as far as the all twenty two, that's a premium service by NFL Game Game Pass, and I don't want to, I don't want to be, you know. I don't want to steal anything. I don't know how else to say it. Um, but that's kind of uh, how I look at that. Now, I find myself watching the TV copy as much as the All-22, unless I'm dissecting the, se- the secondary pre-snap sugar. So with that being said, man, um, whoever you are, listener, anonymous, um, don't be afraid to use the TV copy. The All-22 is fun. Don't get me wrong. And some of the, the views from behind the line of scrimmage is cool. But if you're looking for that, Go purchase NFL Game Pass. It's definitely worth it. Um, I think you can even go back and listen to the home and away radio broadcast too. So if you're just – you want to relive the game the next day, I've done that several times. and just put on Larry McCarron and uh, Wayne Larrabee, you know, Packers call of a, a great win and listen to them call the game. They We got two of the best radio announcers in the, in the entire NFL. So, um, all right, we're a little late on time. I want to get into this, though. I'm going to go ahead and share the screen. Hopefully you guys can hear this okay. Um, and this was three things. Uh, and first of all, thank you, Anonymous, for the, <laughs> the message. Um, there was some good stuff there. I learned a lot, and I had several statistics I was able to add to my big board. That's going to be really fun to, to kind of see how that matches up as we go through the 2023 season. But this was three things by Larry McCarron, Wes Hockowitz, and Mike Spofford. I'm going to go ahead and play this video. We'll kind of recap what they said real quick. This is coming out of camp getting ready to go into training camp um, as we take the break. They basically gave each – it's called three things. They each gave one thing that they came away from camp with. I'll kind of give my two cents on what what I think about each of those three topics. We'll get you guys out of there. But uh, here we go. Hey, everybody. It's three guys with three things, and Mike, you are up. Well, Larry, in the – handful of practices we got to see from the Green Bay Packers this offseason. If there is one word I would use to describe new quarterback, new starting quarterback Jordan Love, it would be aggressive. I thought he attacked. I thought he pushed boundaries. I thought he tested some things. He was willing to let it rip out there on the practice field. I think that's what the coaches wanted to see to get to know him a little better. I think it's what he needed to do. He learned some lessons along the way. I think it's going to serve him well into his first training camp as QB1. Thank you, Mike. Wes? Larry, we finally got to watch Anders Carlson kick during minicamp and count me impressed by the young man and his leg strength. Now, on Tuesday, it was inside the Don Hudson Center because of some rain outside. Kicked really well, showed a lot of leg strength, but, you know, it's inside, you know, controlled environment. He goes out on Wednesday, and my goodness, in addition to going six for six on all of his field goal attempts, during one of the seven-on-seven periods, he actually was just kicking right directly in front of us from here to me to the camera. 
And just the amount of power that that young man with his six foot five frame generates, there's going to be good days, there's going to be bad days. It's going to be a long process for the rookie kicker, but he has all the leg talent that you could ask for. Guys, I come out of this off-season program much the way I went into it, thinking this team has talent and the draft only made it more so. Now, granted, some, not all of that talent is young and there's going to be some growing pains. What did the old college coach say? Best thing about freshmen is they become sophomores. <laughs> there will be some growing pains, but that's where attitude and leadership come into play and the Packers rank at the top of the charts in both. I sense a real commitment on this group's part to get this thing collectively, not about one guy, it's about everybody. I've always thought pro football is the greatest team sport ever invented, and this group will get it done that way as a team. And All right, love it, love it, love it. So what they said there, um, let's just recap real quick. We'll get you guys out of there. Number one, Jordan Love, right? They said he was aggressive, testing boundaries, right? And the thing about that, you get – you get two different responses. You get people on Twitter going, oh, God, he's throwing a bunch of interceptions. Guys, Aaron threw a ton of interceptions during uh, mini camps, OTAs, um, which some of you guys are going, he never went to OTAs. Yes, he did. It was only two years he didn't go, and we know why he didn't go. He was protesting. He was ticked off, whatever. But you heard about it in training camp and OTAs. He was constantly throwing interceptions, right? And when they would ask him about it, what would he say? Well, this is the time to test those boundaries. Right. So the people that are bashing Jordan Love on Twitter going, oh, God, he's looking at me interceptions. He's throwing. He's horrible. No, this is the time to see. All right. What what can I get away with? What can I get away with? Again, guys, the number one statistic that we need. The number one thing we need to be focused on is limiting our turnovers and maximizing takeaways. Right. So we have that turnover differential playing in our favor. That sixty nine point six percent plus one, eighty three point nine percent at plus two, ninety point seven at plus three. Okay. That's, it's going to be absolutely huge. Now is the time, OTAs, training camp, to test those limits, test those boundaries, and see what you can accomplish, what you can get away with. Now, there's things that you shouldn't be doing, which Aaron or which uh, Jordan pointed out the other day, which is a big no-no, throwing across your body, laid across the middle, right? There's all these things that quarterback coach Tom Clements is really putting an emphasis on. Why is that? Why is that a huge no-no? Think about it, guys. And, and we were talking about – how Belichick emphasizes protecting the football, right? Staying within your keys, staying within the structure of the system. Don't get too off cuff, right? And then on defense, the tip drills and the eyes on the ball. What, what is it that Tom Clements is implementing? He's got these cardinal sins, and one of those is never throw late across the middle, okay? what? Think about that, and then think about the conversation we had of um, Aaron never went across the middle, right? You see how it's starting to make sense? Maybe it wasn't just Aaron Rodgers refuses to throw across the middle. The quarterback coach is teaching, don't go across the middle late, which typically when you go across the middle, it's a part of your hot read. It means they fired a blitz or they showed a little bit of sugar dropped out of a zone and you've got a hot read that you can quick hit across the middle, right? Which means if it's not there, where is your ladder plays going to be? Probably along the boundaries or a deep crossing route that ends up along the boundary by the time the ball is completed, like the, the big Sammy Watkins catch that we talked about, the Jaden Reed college catch kind of goes hand-in-hand hand with, the, the big climb play, the Y climb play, um, things like that. So typically your later reads within the progression of any passing concept is going to be a dump-off pass to the flat or somewhere along the boundary because that first read typically is deep shot, middle, then boundary right? That's a lot of how the West Coast offense works. Now, you're going to have Texas routes coming out of the backfield. You're going to have wrap concepts like we talked about. I wouldn't consider that late. If you're going to a deep dig on a wrap concept, it's probably the second read because what you're doing is you're coming to the line of scrimmage. Your pre-snap read is telling you where's my hat count on each side of the field. If you've got a double wrap concept, okay, let's assume you've got a wrap concept on the right, a wrap concept on the left, meaning let's say you're just in a simple spread four wide receiver, whether the Y's flex and it's actually a tight end on one of those sides, it don't matter. Let's just It's going to be a two-by-two two set, two receivers on the left, two receivers on the right. The outside receivers are, 
uh, receivers are both running deep digs, right, which means 10 yards and they're running an in route. And the underneath are going to run a sit, okay, which is a five yard curl, five yard sit, however you want to, you know, hit, however you want to call it. People have different names for the same routes. It's so silly, but I try to cover all the bases to, to give you guys a visualization. So if you're running a double wrap, okay, ball snapped. First of all, before the ball snap, pre snap, you're looking and go, where's my hat count? Okay, this safety's in the box, which suggests he's either blitzing or he's going to have that curl covered up. So when the ball snapped, if that safety doesn't blitz, that means he's dropping underneath that curl. That curl's taken away. My pre snap hat, as soon as the ball is snapped, I know I'm looking left. That's where my play is. When you look left, you're going high low. Okay. Are they sitting on the curl or is that zone or man coverage guy going to drift back and take away the deep dig and kind of play that? All right. We'll give them underneath. If that's the case, the, the, the foot is planted within probably a second or two. The ball comes out to the curl. Let's get some yak and try to turn this into a, you know, anywhere from a five to a seven yard game because they're playing a little soft. If they're playing aggressive and playing bump, guess what? Same pre snap. No sugar, ball snapped. You see the right side's not there. Your pre-snap hat count rolls you immediately to the left. They're playing underneath on the curl aspect of the wrap concept. I'm hammering the dig. That's not laid across the middle, okay? That's that's actually on time across the middle. What they're talking about laid across the middle is progressions that start on the outside and work their way in, right? So that you very seldom see that because typically when they do that, it's because they're walking someone out of the zone. It's still within the structure of the, the structure of the offense. But when you throw late across the middle, that's going to lead to interceptions because what it is is it's not a part of your side adjustment. It's not a part of your progression typically. It's, okay, one isn't there, two isn't there, three isn't there, crap. At no point should you go, let me go back across the middle. More bad things happen than good when you do that. All right, that's what they were referring to. That's one of the things that Tom Clements and Matt LaFleur is teaching to do what? Limit turnovers. Therefore, win, give you a better opportunity to win the turnover battle, giving you a better, higher winning percentage. It's it's that simple. It really is. Um, all right, second comment. Um, they said Anders Carlson showing tremendous leg strength. He went six for six on Wednesday in field goals. Dude, I'm getting excited. You guys know me and Ryan could not make sense of the Anders. Uh, he said Anders. I'm going to say Anders because I'm just reading it like that. Please forgive me if I'm getting the name wrong. You guys know by now, I don't focus on how to pronounce names correctly. If somebody gets mad, I've never gotten mad because somebody mispronounced my name, right? Whether it was my middle name, first name, whatever. I don't get mad over that stuff. I'm sorry. I don't have an ego like that. And the people that like to dunk on people for getting names wrong, uh, you know, I'm not sitting before I go into the podcast room and going, let me make sure I've got these name pronunciations just right. That's not me, right? I'm talking X's and O's, and we're trying to learn something. I'm not out here to stroke anybody's ego or try to pretend like I'm I'm willing to dunk on someone because they don't know how to pronounce a name. So he said Anders. I'm saying Anders. At some point, I'm sure I'll get it right, and I'll settle in on that. Anyway, Anders Carlson, <laughs> he showed leg strength. He went six for six and field goals on Wednesday. Guys, he's got a six-foot-five frame, and, and the scouting report suggests he's got a powerful leg, right? You need – power in that leg that's one thing that mason crosby started to lose a little bit and you kidding me dude if i went out and tried to kick three field goals in one day i'd be on the couch for a week and a half with ice on my back and my leg and everything else right so i'm not sitting there trying to pretend like you know it's a big deal that mason crosby lost kick power um he was still a great kicker but this is about the future and about saving some of that cap we probably saved somewhere between three and five million dollars on the cap with anders carlson being our our kicker right but going six for six on field goals on Wednesday, him showing great leg strength outside, just like uh, I think it was Wes Hockowitz said. It might have been Spofford. Um, it sounds like Rich Bisaccia might have found him one. And, again, the only reason Keyshawn Nixon's on the team last year and this year is because of Rich Bisaccia. It really is. And, and Pat O'Donnell fixing the Hogan game, right? We, we literally went with Jack Coco last year. The snap game got fixed. Right. That was all Rich Passaccia fixing that. Then we get rid of him and bring in uh, Matt Orzik, I think is how you say his now. So they're 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 expecting it to increase even better. Right. Improve even more this year. Rich Passaccia is doing things, man. And as we broke down the numbers the other night on our live stream, Ryan did an excellent job digging into that, dude. It was pretty freaking cool 
that uh, the special teams took the jump it did, especially there in the latter part of the uh, the year, and we getting a lot more stabilized with with Keyshawn Nixon. I got, it, it it bothers me to think of how good this team could have been if we had Keyshawn Nixon returning kicks all year long. And some people say, "Oh, hindsight's twenty twenty. No, Keyshawn was pounding the table. They didn't even give him an opportunity. That's there's no no two ways about that, guys. That that's just bad coaching, and that's probably Matt Lafleur's decision more than Rich Basaccia's. Now, Rich Basaccia could have, you know could have kind of uh, flexed his muscle a little bit and asked, asked Matt to do it. But I think what was going on there was you were – I hate to say it, but it's on Goody. Goody was trying to make Amari Rodgers out to be something he wasn't. And it reminded me so much of Demarius Randall trying to play safety and 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 some of these other guys that they tried to fit these square pegs and round holes, you know. Um, it, it's, I don't know, it's just troublesome to me that, that you couldn't see that Keyshawn Nixon was that much better than Amari Rodgers in the return game. And it's amazing how Amari Rodgers gets cut and everybody blamed Aaron. Well, Aaron just didn't like him. Aaron didn't give him an opportunity. Aaron didn't like him. No, no. Coach didn't like him. I want to say this. Everything always falls back on it's Aaron Rodgers' fault. Now, I know people, there's some on the other side of the fence that say, no, Aaron Rodgers can do no wrong in your eyes. That's not the case. But to pretend like Aaron didn't like Amari Rodgers, you understand Amari Rodgers was Randall Cobb's godson, okay? Like, Randall Cobb's wide receiver coach at Kentucky was T. Martin, all right? T. Martin is Amari Rogers' dad, okay? So Amari Rogers grew up around Randall Cobb. When they brung Randall Cobb in, it was going to be, he's going to teach Amari Rogers how to play this, uh, this slot receiver role and be a good return guy and all these things, right? Amari Rogers just didn't pan out. Now, to pretend like Aaron Rodgers didn't like him, that's why he didn't get an opportunity. So you're telling me that Aaron, best friend on the team, arguably best friend on the team, Randall Cobb, and Aaron conspired against Amari Rodgers so he wouldn't have an opportunity, but Amari Rodgers is Randall Cobb's godson? Come on, dude. We're trying to grab every little thing we can to make fun of Aaron Rodgers and make him out to be this evil person. So I think what happened to Amari Rodgers, I think Matt LaFleur, didn't like him. I think Rogers seen that Cobb would probably give you a better opportunity um, to win right now. And everything last year was geared around, let's try to win right now. And it just didn't work out, whether it was injuries to your two best offensive linemen, your best pass rusher, your inside linebacker, uh, your quarterback had a broken thumb, on and on and on and on. So it is what it is. But Anders Carlson, the thing that comes down uh, comes out of this to me, He had an ACL. He tore an ACL on his plant leg, and it seems like that's checked out. If they're seeing, if Wes Hockowitz and those guys are seeing more than enough power in that leg, that plant leg plays a big role in that. That tells me the ACL was a success, and we've got us a kicker for the next four years. Uh, Now, let's see how he does in stressful situations. Man, that is a totally different ballgame, right? Um, I couldn't imagine, man, how – Watching the game, and I know you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. If, if you ain't got a huge ego, you're going, yep, Clayton, I agree with you. I know what you're about to say. When I'm sitting on this couch and that game's on the line and Mason Crosby has to kick a field goal, I'm a nervous freaking wreck. And I always think, how in the hell is he walking out there and his legs aren't shaking to try to kick this game with a field goal? <laughs> Maybe you guys are different. I don't know. That's the way I see it. Um, number three, Larry McCarron and his twisted up pinky. God love him. That thing is hanging on for dear – life man that was uh I, i'm telling you it's uh it could fall off at any second you guys know what i'm talking about if you watch the video but uh he's he's talking about this team has has a lot of talent in the draft solidified that talent he's not looking at this team like oh man i don't know they're a little shaky if everyone's healthy this is as talented a football team as you're going to find in the national football league the big question mark is can jordan love be a top 10 quarterback Can he be a top 15? If he's a top 15 quarterback, they're going to compete. If he's a top 10 quarterback, I think they got a chance to win 10 games. Now, if he's, you know, closer to that 15 and maybe, you know, around the 20 mark, being the first year, it doesn't mean you need to write him off. It just means, okay, we got our first year under our belt. Let's see if he gets better next year. And if not, then we need to move on and find another quarterback. But if he dips into that lower half, you're going to be closer to that five or six year, six win season, in my opinion. That's really what's going to come into play. And again, it's going to come down to turnover differential, middle late, red zone scoring. 
all those things are going to be important. But like Larry pointed out, man, team has a lot of talent. They're very young. There's going to be growing pains. We all know that. I think our fan base is really settled in. on Okay, let's just see what we got here. Let's get around this team. Let's rally around. Let's get behind them and see what they can do. Okay. Um, and the one thing that's not missing, like Larry pointed out, it's this attitude of this team is not about one guy. And make no you know, mistake about it. That was a shot at Aaron Rodgers from Larry McCarron. <laughs> Larry McCarron said, it's not about one one guy. Who who could he have been talking about? He was talking about Aaron. And I have talked about that. I'm a big Aaron Rodgers fan, have been, you know. Uh, now this year, hey, we got a better draft pick on the line. Now that I understand exactly how that trade unfolded, I hope he falls on his face like the guy. But I want a better draft pick as a Packer fan. Now, I'm not a Packer fan. Who's going to tell other Packer fans that, hey, you're not allowed to root for Aaron Rodgers? That's silly. That's silly. You shouldn't tell anybody how to fan. I'm just telling you, you guys heard me. I wish him all the best in New York. And then when I found out the details of the trade that, hey, look, the worst they play, as long as he plays 65% of the snaps, we get a better draft pick, man. First and foremost, I'm a Packer fan, you know. Outside of that, I hope he does do good, you know. If if our season's over, right, and they make it to the Super Bowl, the Jets, I ain't going to BS you. I'll probably be sitting there going, go get you another ring, Aaron, and and be excited about welcoming him back when he does retire and, and comes back home when he retires as a Packer. Uh, but that's just kind of how I see it. But like Larry said, man, the attitude of this team is not about one guy, and uh, it's exciting. I'm a big Aaron Rodgers fan. That's what I was going to say, and I'm going to wrap up. But that was a cloud over that locker room. I'm not saying it was necessarily a bad cloud, but that dude was – he was the guy in Green Bay. He's gone now. Now what this team's got to do is rally around each other, rally around Jordan Love, and you're seeing that. You're seeing Romeo Dobbs go to bat for Jordan Love. You're seeing Christian Watson go to bat for Jordan Love. You're seeing – I think another one that really likes Jordan Love, just based off of the celebrating and stuff when they scored in Philly, is Elton Jenkins. I think Elton Jenkins is a big Jordan Love guy. Aaron Jones in the offseason said, there's no doubt in my mind, Jordan Love is better than most starting quarterbacks in this league. Check him on it. He's, he's on board, right? Jair Alexander's on board. Keyshawn Nixon's on board. Let's go out and get this thing, man. And I think Larry McCarron hit the uh, hit the nail on the head there. This is this is going to be a going to be an attitude of of team, not one guy. And I'm excited about it. So we're going to get out of here. We'll get this live for you as soon as possible, so it should go out on Sunday afternoon. <clears throat> and then, of course, we'll be back Sunday night. Uh, Packers total ac- totals access live with uh, with Ryan. Hopefully, we'll have a few callers call in. We're going to in- incorporate that into the show. That'll be going live on Monday. So you guys are going to get plenty of content early in the work week. And if you're listening to this on Monday, making us a part of your day, we really appreciate you doing that. As always, let's go out and be the change we want to see in the world and go Pack Go. For Jordan Love. 37. Here he is throwing in the middle. It's caught by Watson. He's got great speed. Turning the corner. Christian Watson down the sideline. And he will score. Whoa. Hang on. Love to Watson. To a one-score game. This one is the stunner. You basically feel like, all right, this Eagles team sort of has this thing under control. And then... Christian Watson hits the Jets again. Six touchdowns now in the last three games. He is really something. When he gets in the open field and running, that was some throw by Jordan Love, too.